and I'm retired, but I previously taught constitutional litigation and civil rights at the Indiana University Maurer School of Law. Nice to see you this morning. Good morning, New Jersey. I am Anna Terry Flores. I'm a state senator from Miami, Florida. And more importantly for you all, I participated in the We the People program, also was part of Unit 5. Um, our school won the national competition that year. So I know how you guys are feeling. Take a deep breath and you'll do a great job. Thank you. Please introduce yourselves and your teacher. Hi, my name is Neethi. I'm representing our team from High School North, and I'm a senior there, and I'm very excited to be here. And I'll pass it on to Zia. Hi, my name is Zia, and I'm in 11th grade. I also go to High School North, and I'm passing it on to my uh, colleague, Jerry. Hi, I'm Jervais Joseph, and I'm also a junior um, at High School North, and I'm excited to be presenting to you guys today, and our teacher is Mr. Paulson. Lovely. Thank you. Welcome to the finals. The question is number two and reads as follows. Quote, a Bill of Rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth, general or particular, and what no just government should refuse or rest on inference, unquote. Do you agree or disagree with Thomas Jefferson? What are the advantages and disadvantages of a National Bill of Rights as compared to state bills of rights? What are the differences between positive and negative rights and which are more important to the preservation of liberty? You may begin, please. The Bill of Rights is a document written in order to create a more perfect union. This bill recognizes some of the most important rights like freedom of speech, press, religion, and assembly. Because of its importance, it is Impossible that America could be the same country without it. The rights recognized by this bill keeps the government power in check and protects and protects our liberty. This is why we agree with Thomas Jefferson that a bill of rights is what the people are entitled to against every government or general or particular, and what no just government should refuse. But just having a bill of rights is not enough. It must also be enforced. This is evident in countries such as North Korea, where legally citizens of North Korea, North Korea have similar rights as those stated in the US Bill of Rights, but the only difference is that these rights are not enforced. The advantages of a national bill of rights is that it creates more confidence in our rights, it's overarching, it gives formal recognition to human rights, it minimizes the risk of federal governments neglecting its constituents, it protects vulnerable populations and unifies the nation under a common set of rights which equalizes everyone. Advantages of the State Bill of Rights are that it is very specific, updated regularly, and allows for certain rights to be extended past just the federal level. In the past, the state governments had broad authority to regulate even personal or private matters. For example, it enabled Idaho to pass a constitutional amendment in 1896 that gave women the right to vote. The disadvantages of the National Bill of Rights are that it is vague, outdated, and due to each right being enshrined in the Bill of Rights, future generations are restricted in changing rights that might be more harmful than good. Some founding fathers believe that if our rights are unalienable, established by God upon creation, then it is not only unnecessary but hazardous to list them out any further. Some said it was unnecessary because a new federal government could in no way endanger the freedoms of press or religion since it was not granted any authority to regulate either. It was dangerous because any listing of rights could potentially be interpreted as exhaustive. Rights submitted could, could be considered as not retained. Additionally, it makes states more politically hom homogenous and pass some amendments that could affect the rights of minorities. Further, it might inadvertently concretize amendments that limit a state's progressiveness since it might make it harder to change harmful policies. Positive rights arise to impose positive duty, the duty to provide or to act in a certain way on others. Oftentimes, the government has to actively do something in order to protect these rights. Some examples of positive rights are the right to counsel and the right to vote. Negative rights are rights that impose negative duty, a duty of non-interference. They are rights that oftentimes restrain and limit government powers. Negative rights also do sometimes require positive action, action taken to counteract action taken against the right. Some examples of negative rights are the freedom of speech and the right to bear arms. The preservation of liberty, the act of maintaining liberty, defined in the Constitution as freedom from arbitrary and unreasonable restraint upon individual. Negative rights are the absence of external limits and protect natural rights, which perfectly fits the definition of liberty, therefore preserving it. Negative rights are also key to preserving liberty since the Constitution consists of negative rights. As Barack Obama, the 45th president of the United States said, the Constitution is a charter of negative rights that says what states can do to you, 
says what the federal government can do to you. They're essential to individuals cannot have liberty without the protection of negative rights, but they can without the protection of positive rights. This is because positive rights are only applicable when negative rights are protected. As Justice Learned Hand said, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help it. Thank you. You mentioned one of the uh, members of the court. Do you think the court has always gotten it right in its interpretation of the application of the Bill of Rights? Um, I don't think they've always gotten it right. I think there's always an influence from um, outside, um, you know, talking in, in the social environment at the time. Um, obviously time from 100 years ago has changed. So I don't think that they've always gotten it right and they've always you know, paid attention to the law. I think there's always been more influence from outside that has affected their, um, the outcome of their decision. Can you think of any cases that uh, over the last century or last couple of decades that have uh, indicated that they didn't get it right? I know I'm putting you on the spot there. So let me have someone ask another question. If it comes up in, in your thought process, you can jump back at it. Um, the Supreme Court has recognized a number of individual rights that are not expressly found in the Constitution. So let me give one example. In the Obergefell case, the Supreme Court recognized the right of same-sex individuals to marry, even though nothing in the Constitution states that there's a right to marry or that same-sex individuals can marry. Um, when is it appropriate for the court to recognize new rights? I think as society progresses and um, just as a nation, we begin to change, um, it is important for the constitution um, and the court to recognize these changes as well. So while same-sex marriage might not have been as um, tolerated in the past, because we realize now that it is, it is an important right to ensure that every citizen has access to the same liberties and the same freedoms of happiness in the pursuit of happiness, the court must um, begin to create new laws and um, accept these changes to ensure that all citizens are happy and treated equally. But how should we decide whether the court should do that or whether we should rely on legislative bodies to recognize that progress, whether those are state legislative bodies or the federal Congress to, to recognize these more, uh, these rights of progress that you've talked about? It's important for legislators to recognize this because they are the ones who have the closest connection to their each um, state and therefore they're representing their state and the needs of the citizens in their state. However, it's also important for the court um, to recognize this nationwide um, because then this creates a more unified understanding of progress for the entire country and extends it past just the state level. Or she mentioned that states, um, like legislation or like state legislation, should be the ones to kind of start or like start bringing about these changes. And I think that's important because as soon as states start implementing these kind of changes, they influence other states, and in turn, they might influence the government as well. So, um, so you all, um, you know, listed and went through all of um, or most of the rights that are listed in the Bill of Rights and recognize that those are um, fundamental and crucial to our nation's founding. Um, but are there times where there should be limits on those rights that are listed in the Bill of Rights? 
And if we do limit those rights, what are the circumstances um, of, of how a court would reason as to whether or not these are justified limits or unjustified limits? I think one more recent example we're seeing um, today is with the Second Amendment and uh, trying to decide whether the right to bear arms is more important than the right of safety um, for people who might feel threatened by the accessibility to guns. So I think in that situation, we could see that it is important to consider whether some of these rights should be limited or just more regulated to ensure that while people still have the right to bear arms, it is um, created in a way that is still um, prioritizes safety above all else. So um, yeah, I think that's one more recent example we're seeing. Um, I think another example is with um, freedom of speech where there is now this line between um, hate speech or is it, can they um, just express their freedom of speech or is it threatening someone else's life? Um, I think there's a confusion in how we deal with this going forward. I know we see this in even our school, where is it like, are we just talking as we could as a freedom of speech or are we you know, putting other people's lives in danger? Are we threatening other people? Or does it classify as hate? You had mentioned uh in the course of your opening remarks, some of the, the negative rights. Are there any negative rights that comes to mind that are not listed in the Bill of Rights that you think should be considered or added? You mentioned, for example, uh, no restriction on freedom of speech, but you talked about that limitation. But are there any negative rights that you think need to be considered added that have not been listed in the Bill of Rights? I think the right to education is one right that I think should be in the Bill of Rights, um, just because education is such an important, it's just an important factor in society. And I think that everyone should have a decent education in order for them to progress and in order for them to have, in order for them to have well-being. Um, another sort of right is the right to health care um, or the access to health care because that's such it's it's a right that is not really it's not really um, enforced I would say it's not even a right but like I think it should be a right that can be enforced in the sense that the right to health care is something that every citizen or every person should be able to have. And very quickly, I wanted to jump in um, from a question from earlier. I think one situation where the court had misinterpreted the Constitution um, was in the Plessy v. Ferguson case, where while they misinterpreted the idea, the Equal Protection Clause, that separate but equal could be constitutional, when in reality that is still um, unconstitutional. Wonderful. Thank you. Matt? This question is, um, I know that as, as part of this, preparing for this question, you looked at constitute, whoop, never mind, saved by the bell. <laughs> saved by the bell. Uh, I'm sure it was going to be a great uh, question. It was a brilliant um, question. I know you would have answered it really well. <laughs> but uh, congratulations to Team New Jersey. Uh, and congratulations uh, uh, to Mr. Polson in preparing his students so well. And uh, judges, I'm going to turn it over to you for feedback. Lovely. Thank you. Nice job, all of you. I could tell you were slightly nervous, but you pulled it off. You, you did a good job in your opening remarks. A few case law would have been nice. I appreciate your coming back and answering my question when I stumped you for a moment. So thank you for that. In uh, response to my question about the negative rights, you took it on a different note and you made, you discussed the positive rights that we should have, uh, which was wonderful. You discussed the right to an education, the right to healthcare, and you expounded on that a bit. So 
you've got some wonderful ideas that I hope in this process that you will play your role in making sure that if these are the things that are important to your generation, you will take the steps to make sure they come to pass in the future and they're incorporated in writing if the right to healthcare and to an education is critical. So lovely job. Thank you. I agree. Absolutely terrific job. You should be very proud of yourselves. Uh, I tell you what I love most about your presentation, uh, and it's something we haven't heard all weekend, uh, which is a very profound insight, which is when you, when you commented that the North Koreans have the same rights that we do, but rights don't matter unless they're actually enforced. Uh, and so rights on a piece of paper uh, are just that, they're a piece of paper. Uh, but your insight that the real hard work is not what the piece of paper says, it's how they actually are played out and realized in day-to-day -day lives of, of human beings, whether those human beings are in North Korea or the United States. That is an incredibly insightful and powerful idea. Uh, and thank you for raising that and doing it in such a succinct and uh, beautiful way. So warmest congratulations on that. I thought you did a great job of answering our questions. And again, thank you, as, as uh, uh, Judge Chin said, going back and, and, and uh, following up uh, with more answers to, to his questions. Um, and I love your right to education is a great right, right to healthcare. I love that answer as well. So just a uh, terrific job. You should be very proud of yourselves. And I really, I really enjoyed your presentation. Yes, I agree. I, I think that you all did a, a great job in your prepared remarks. Um, we're able to give us some good examples um, in some of the, the, um, the questions that we asked. Um, I picked up on the same point as far as differentiating um, with North Korea. Um, you know, I think that's that's a that's a great point. I think that a lot of people sometimes you know miss a, around the, the world is um, you know what good are these rights if um, we don't actually have an entity that's going to ensure and enforce that they exist. I mean, I think that's that's the the beauty of our of our country. Um, is that for the most part, we try to um, to have entities and groups that that enforce and protect those rights. And I think that's what sets us apart from so many other places that might just have it on a piece of paper. Um, so again, I think you all did a great job um, responding to the question. You should be very proud of yourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.